Welcome to LCAP Development Series Session 2. Uh, this session will focus on analyzing progress towards LCAP goals. I'm Lily Rosenberger, and along with Michael Hernandez, we'll be facilitating uh, today's session. I want to take a moment to introduce the Learning Network. This is your team of management analysts who stand ready to support you in the development of your, um, of your LCAP. And um, our fearless leader, Dr. Heather Richter, Administrator of Continuous Improvement and Support, is um, also here to support you. Today joining us is uh, Jonathan Medina, who is a District Fiscal Analyst and he will be sharing um, the new action tables with you. So just a quick review of where we've been, where we're going. Um, you should have received the first um, training uh, video on engaging educational partners. Uh, today's session, again, on analyzing progress towards LCAP goals. Today's session will be followed up with a virtual workshop, which is scheduled for February 22nd. Uh, you want to make sure and register for the workshops that you uh, choose to attend. After today's session, uh, there's three more videos that'll be coming your way and the dates are here. Um, here's a session resource with hyperlinks. This is how you access this recording. Um, again, we have the slide deck and other resources that we'll be sharing during today's session. We're gonna continue using this icon of the full guy with the magnifying glass to highlight lessons learned from previous year's reviews and from our collaboration with other county offices um, as well as with CDE. Our intent here is really to help you be as transparent as possible, both to help reviewers ensure your LCAP is meeting all requirements and to help you avoid unnecessary negative attention from advocacy groups who may question transparency in LCAPs. Uh, today's objectives are to provide a process for analyzing progress towards LCAP goals, to inform your upcoming LCAP, and to improve outcomes for all students. We'll review the requirements for responding effectively to the prompts in the analysis section of the template, and we'll provide an overview of the new action tables. Um, in our first session, we shared the slide with you. And again, we wanna just quickly review California's framework for account accountability and continuous improvement. This framework is centered on the three principles of equity, transparency, and local control. These principles will continue to guide our work as we explore how to strengthen LCAPs to better reflect the state's intent under the new accountability system um, and improvement efforts focused on your local needs. One of the goals of the new LCAP template is to help shift uh, the focus from compliance to continuous improvement. Since the goal of the LCAP has always been to improve outcomes for all students. Today, these principles will be evident in the processes we share to guide your analysis of progress towards your district LCAP goals. Um, this is just a quick review of the LCAP templates, the elements of your LCAP that should be included. Again, the budget overview for parents is considered part of the LCAP, as well as the supplement to the annual update to the 21-22 LCAP, which you, um, which you should have um, reviewed with your board by February 28th. Again, we'll be focusing on uh, the template today, some action tables, um, and the instructions. A reminder that the instructions are for the writer. The instructions include the detail that is required as you respond to your prompts. And we'll be going over those today. So today's session, again, will focus specifically on the goal analysis section of the template, as well as the action tables. These are linked in the resource document, um, as you see here. A reminder here that this analysis section of the template will be need, need to be duplicated for each goal in your LCAP. So let's begin with what has changed. Remember in the previous LCAP, the annual update was a separate document, which included the previous year's goal, a comparison of annual measurable outcomes, comparison of budgeted and actual expenditures, and successes and challenges of implementation. This separate annual update section has been eliminated 
Instead, this information will be reported in your new, the new action tables or within the goal analysis section of the LCAP. So same information you're reporting, just in different places. Uh, we wanna share this model for continuous improvement. Uh, we'd like for you to keep this model in mind as you consider the, the goal analysis process. You're probably familiar with this model that starts with the question, what specifically are we trying to accomplish? This is communicated through your district's LCAP goals, which have been designed based on the needs of your students and community. The next question is, how will we know that it changes an improvement? The answer to this question is communicated through the metrics in your LCAP, aligned to the state priorities and to each of your goals. Finally, we ask, what change might be introduced and why? This is communicated through your LCAP actions. And throughout the year, you've been implementing these actions and monitoring student progress. This is the plan and do of the PDSA cycle that you see here. The goal analysis process is an opportunity to study the impact of these actions on student outcomes. This analysis might lead us to take action by revising goals, actions, or metrics in the upcoming LCAP. So kind of keep this model in mind as we go through the processes that we're gonna share with you today. The goal analysis process will be documented in the goal analysis section of the LCAP, but notice the arrows are pointing at the 22-23 LCAP goals and actions. The revisions you may decide to make based on this analysis will be reflected in the upcoming LCAP goals and actions. Um, this section of the template will be addressed in our upcoming uh, LCAP development series session. So here we've just outlined this goal analysis process for you. Um, this process includes an analysis of each LCAP goal and how it was carried out in the previous year. It's a process for reflecting on um, what are the differences between my budgeted expenditures and estimated actual expenditures. And it includes an analysis of the implementation of planned actions, an analysis of the effectiveness of those actions in achieving the desired outcomes. And from this analysis, the district will determine whether changes to the goals, metrics, or actions for the upcoming LCAP um, year are needed. Notice the steps in blue are not part of the analysis, rather they're necessary steps to inform the analysis of each goal. This process will inform the four required prompts in the goal analysis section that you see here. And we'll go into detail um, with each uh, prompt and provide you with some sample responses. You'll notice that the process we share with you isn't going to necessarily be in order of the prompts, um, which is okay. Whatever way works for you is fine, but the way we're going to share it with uh, the process with you won't necessarily follow the order of these prompts, which would mean looking at the implementation of the planned actions first. But not to worry, we're going to cover each one of those with you. So, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan in a moment, who will walk you through the new annual update action tables that will need to be completed before analyzing the differences between budgeted expenditures and estimated actual expenditures. So Jonathan, when you're ready, take it away. Thank you, Lily. So today I'm going to be going over some of the action tables that are new to the LCAP this year. The action tables are actually just five tables that all compile a district's LCAP expenditure data. Now the first two, the total planned expenditures table and the contributing actions table will contain, contain data for the district's coming uh, year LCAP. That's gonna be the 2022-2023 LCAP. And the last three, the annual update, the contributing actions annual update and the LCFF carryover tables, all of those contain LCAP data for the current year LCAP. That's the 2021-2022 LCAP. So today I'm just gonna introduce you to the tables looking at the current year data, and I'll spend the most time reviewing the LCFF carryover table. So next, we have the annual update table, and the purpose of this table is to assign estimated actual expenditure amounts to your LCAP actions. 
all actions from your board approved LCAP should be included on this table. And if your district has added any new LCAP actions mid-year, then they should be added. Make sure to include any actions related to the 15% concentration grant add-on if that applies to your district. So the key takeaway for this slide was, uh, you know, for the annual update is to make sure that all LCAP actions are accounted for on the table. And number two, make sure that the estimated actual amounts that you input represent the, the cost that your district truly expects to incur by the closing of the books. And that's going to be very critical because it, that's what's going to impact your carryover calculation. The next table is the contributing actions annual update table. And the purpose of it is to isolate the actions from the annual update that increase or improve services. Now, the majority of data in this table will automatically populate for all users, but users will need to input revised LCFF supplemental and concentration grant funding. And that's going to be done shown there the, uh, with the figure in the red box. So the key takeaway for this table, again, is that districts are going to need to update their LCFF calculator based on the May revise, and that will help them determine what their estimated actual LCFF entitlements are. That's for the LCFF base grant, supplemental grant, and concentration grant. And they're all going to be needed for these tables. And uh, districts should ensure that only contributing actions are included on this table. So now we get to the LCFF carryover table. And the purpose of this table is to determine the LCFF carryover that districts must account for in their 2022-2023 LCAPs. Now this table uses data from all the four previous tables to perform the calculation. And I'm gonna cover each of the nine table, uh, fields on this table uh, so you know exactly where the data comes from and how the figures are calculated. So first on the left, we have the estimated actual LCFF base grant amount field. And as mentioned earlier, districts will need to revise the LCFF calculators based on the May revise, and this is where the uh, revised base grant amount will need to go. So next is the LCFF supplemental and concentration grants field. And if you remember, you know, we needed this information for, for a previous table, so this field will automatically populate, but I do recommend you check, double check it for accuracy. The third field is the LCFF carryover percentage for prior year. For this year, all districts will enter zero. 2021-2022 is intended to serve as a baseline because it's the first year that legislative regulations on supplemental and concentration grant carryover have been implemented. Our guidance to districts that have been tracking carryover is to spend those dollars as they were intended to be spent. Those dollars were generated by your unduplicated students, so they should be spent on those undu unduplicated students but still enter zero in this field. The fourth field is the total percentage to increase or improve services for the current year. This field automatically calcula calculates, it takes your estimated actual supplemental and concentration grants and divides that total by the estimated actual base grant. Prior year carryovers and added to the quotient to determine your final percentage. So on this example on the screen, you'll see we have 2.5 million divided by 10 million plus 0% 0, 0 carryover resulting in 25%. So the fifth field is total estimated actual expenditures for contributing actions. And this cell totals the estimated actual expenditures for all actions that contribute to increase and improve services. The data here is pulled directly from the contributing actions annual update table. And remember, your estimated actual expenditures should reflect the amounts that your district truly expects to incur by the closing of the books. So the sixth field is the total estimated actual percentage of improved services. So education code was revised this year to allow districts to claim a percentage of improved services for certain qualitative actions that do not have any funding associated with them. Plainly stated, districts can have actions in their LCAP that have zero assigned funding yet still use them to claim a percentage of improved services to count towards the district's increase in improved services requirement. This percentage can then be used to offset or reduce a district's carryover. The sixth field right here is where districts would show the percentage for those actions. Now, the percentage for improved services for actions with no funding is qualitative and subjective in nature, and KCSOS believes the intent of the LCFF and specifically supplemental and concentration grants is to increase and improve services for unduplicated students through the funding provided by the state. We continue to inter interpret ed code in this light, 
And it's our recommendation and expectation that quantitative actions, those are the actions with associated funding, that those remain the standard. While the use of qualitative actions is allowed, we believe them to be the exception and not the rule. So if you do believe you have an action that meets the parameters of a qualitative action, please reach out to your management analyst so the action can be discussed with administration for approval. So the next field is the estimated actual percentage of increased or improved services. Now this cell is gonna automatically calculate and it's gonna take your estimated actual expenditures and divide them by your base grant. So the eighth field is the LCFF carryover dollar amount. And this cell automatically calculates the amount of carryover your district will need to account for and report on in the 2022-2023 LCAP. It takes your required percentage to increase services and subtracts the estimated actual percentage, then multiplies the difference by the base grant. Now, lastly, we have the, the LCFF carryover percentage field. And this field also automatically calculates, but it takes the LCFF carryover dollar amount and divides that by the grace base grant field uh, to determine a percentage. <clears throat> So there's one thing to remember with the LCFF carryover table. The LCFF carryover dollar amount and the carryover percentage are an integral part of the increase and improved services section of the LCAP template. Your district will need to include actions in the 2022-23 LCAP to expend any carryover amount identified by the 2021-22 LCFF carryover table. So that really, uh, uh, completes my presentation. This was just a brief overview of the new action tables. We will be performing guided walkthroughs of the action tables, both in DTS and Excel at the follow-up meeting on February 22nd. So if you haven't joined that, if you wanna join that workshop, please make sure you sign up for the session. And if you need help with that, please reach out to your management analyst or your fiscal advisor. So from here, I'm gonna send it back to Michael. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan. And hello again, everyone. Michael here from the Learning Network. I'm going to go through an analyzing differences between budgeted expenditures and estimated actual expenditures. This is located within the goal analysis section, and it is actually prompt number two. So let's take a look at the prompt and what it's actually asking us to do. What it, this is asking you to do is take a look at your annual update table, what was the difference between your budgeted expenditures and what you estimate to be your actuals. I want to emphasize here what Jonathan mentioned earlier. Those estimated actuals are what you have spent from your LCAP and transparency is important here. Minor differences and dollar for dollar accounting is not required. However, you know your community and the budget you work with. Therefore, a substantive difference or material difference may be different from district to district. While well, each district determines what to call out as a material difference, this is part of that local control. A rule of thought here is to possibly consider what might your educational partners consider to be substantial? Might that be a number or a percent? Some may use the 10% as a substantial difference for all actions within their LCAP, while others might call out dollar amounts. Let's take a closer look at those material differences uh, and what Jonathan reviewed earlier with the annual update table. On this screen, what you see here is the annual update table. If I get my cursor to work here. Uh, here in the middle, what I wanna point out is action number two and action number three. The reason why I want to point that, those out is those are the only two actions in this example that have some material difference within what was planned and what was actually um, the estimated actuals. And you can see those uh, two, the differences there, what's highlighted there in gold. While this annual update table shows you differences in amounts, what it does not tell you is it does not explain as to why those actions were implemented or not and why there is a material difference with the cost between what you uh, were going to spend versus what you actually spent. So a question may come here to say, what are these actions? What is the material difference and why? Let's continue on and take another look at that annual update table. 
Again, the same table pulling out action number two and action number three. If I look closer at what those actual actions are, I know with this example that action two and three uh, is professional development and action three was online tutoring services. Um, those are the two that I want to be able to speak to in that prompt. Now, there are a lot of actions written for this goal, which was to improve academic language and proficiency for English learners. And really the ultimate outcome was to improve outcomes for English learners. So when we take a closer look, we know that all these actions were written to um, drive this goal forward. But action two had a larger uh, amount, and I don't wanna focus in on the amount, but I wanna focus in on which one had the material difference that I want to explain to my educational partners. So using consistent reporting out regarding material difference, I'm going to call out action number two for this example. Here's what it might look like. Let's take a look at a sample response within that prompt. So again, this prompt is asking for an explanation. Um, here is the sample response. As I looked at a uh, needs uh, or conducted analysis of material difference between budgeted expenditures and the estimated actuals, the total budgeted for the 21-22 LCAP goal number one was $1,100,000. So there you can pull that from your uh, actual um, annual update table. The estimated actual expenditures for 21-22 LCAP goal one was $1,070,000. Again, using transparency, I'm listing out the difference. There's a difference here of $30,000. The substantial difference that I want to bring to your attention for my educational partners was actually action number two. Remember, that was an action that was uh, professional development to uh, um, teach some strategies for ELD and grading practices. And that had a substantial difference. I'm gonna call it out here of $25,000. This last part of it is really a, a key part of this explanation. It's explaining why, what happened, um, explaining why to your educational partners. So again, I'm saying here, again, we've all lived through the COVID year and we had a lack of substitutes this past year. So therefore that could have been a reason why staff couldn't attend this PD. There could be many other reasons, but for this prompt, I'm gonna use this reason due to lack of substitutes available to provide professional development to staff to attend training. So again, there's the why behind, um, there was a material difference here. Um, this next slide is really the frame that um, we um, want you to consider. Um, you can use this. I wanna point out here that um, while this is a frame for you to use as a guide, that you would continue on with this frame if you're going to uh, continue to use it for each goal um, as you have go uh, different goals within your LCAP. Um, this shows transparency doing it this way, but you can tell your story in other ways as you see that it might make sense for your educational partners as you have local control to do this. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Lily. Take it away, Lily. Alrighty, thank you, Michael. So the next step in the process is to analyze the implementation of planned actions. So we can look at our planned actions for each goal as fitting into one of two buckets. In one bucket, we have actions implemented as planned to achieve the LCAT goal. In the other bucket, we have actions that perhaps were not implemented as, as, we, as we had planned. This might include actions that were paused due to the impact of COVID-19 or for other reasons. We know this year um, pro providing professional development was a challenge because of a shortage of substitutes. Uh, we understand that perhaps some positions you hope to fill remained vacant. Those are just some examples of why some actions might have not been implemented as planned. Prompt one of the goal analysis section um, asks for a description of any substantive differences in planned actions and actual implementation of these actions. Here, you'll wanna describe an overall implementation of the actions to achieve each goal. 
You want to include a discussion of relevant challenges and successes and call out and explain any actions not implemented or substantive, substantive differences between what you had planned to implement and what was actually implemented. Um, here's a lesson learned um, that we have learned from past reviews. Um, you wanna make sure whenever the prompt says to provide a description that you include a narrative and not um, necessarily just bullet points. For example, you wouldn't just include bullet points of the actions that were not completely implemented. You would wanna include a explanation of why they were not implemented fully as planned. So here, let's look at a process uh, that you might consider for analyzing um, the implementation of your actions. Again, this is a place that we have uh, some lessons learned from past reviews. Um, sometimes when we say uh, full implementation, we might be describing that we provided a service, right? We, we plan to have an after school uh, program for English learners that would focus on academic language and we provided that service. So we might call that fully implemented. We wanna encourage you to think a little differently about implementation of planned actions. So we would like for you to consider does providing a service constitute full implementation of an action, even if the action doesn't unfold the way the district had planned. Generally, the district will have some goals in mind for providing a service. Uh, for example, providing this after school program for English learners, you might have an idea of the attendance rate that you would hope to meet, right, by providing that service. Uh, the question is, would you consider that as you're considering the level of implementation of a given action? Um, what we've noticed in previous years, again, uh, that sometimes full implementation is reported for a set of actions in a goal yet the desired outcomes are not achieved. Going through a process um, such as this can help the district identify the reason why desired outcomes might not be achieved. This step can also help the district identify successes and challenges of implementing the actions in a goal. This information can then be used to scale up or replicate successes that are found or to strengthen actions um, that need strengthening in order to overcome some of those challenges. We provided some questions that might guide this process, uh, thinking about what data sources might be used to determine level of implementation, besides whether the service was provided, uh, who might be able to support the collection uh, and analysis of this data. Um, this is a process that would take time. So recruiting folks uh, to help with this um, as appropriate, uh, whether it be site principals, right, as part of their SIPSET development, or perhaps district specialists. If I'm working with actions that are uh, aimed at improving outcomes for, for English learners, maybe I can bring on our EL specialist to help collect and analyze some of this data. Um, some additional questions are, what would constitute substantive differences for each of the actions? For example, if attendance was important for me, for a service I'm providing after school, what attendance rate would I consider to be full implementation? Would it be 90% attendance rate or lower? So kind of having some of those um, ideas in mind. And then finally, how will the factors impacting the success or challenges of implementation be identified? Uh, so this is to say what additional data might be needed um, to find out uh, why we're having success or why we are encountering some challenges, what might be the reason for some of those challenges. So this is a process to consider. We will be digging deeper into this process at the follow-up workshop. So if this is of interest to you, we'll providing, we will be providing some examples uh, and letting you talk with others through, through this process um, at that uh, follow-up virtual workshop. So here's a sample response to prompt one. Uh, where I'm reporting on the implementation of planned actions. So I'll just read it for you. While all actions in this goal were fully implemented as planned, not all students benefited equally from their implementation. Some challenges and successes are described below. 
So in this example, I've just provided one action for you and provided an example of how I might call out some of the successes and challenges. So the next step in this process will be to collect year one outcomes in order to help us analyze the effectiveness of action. So I will turn it over to Michael and um, he'll be going over this piece with you. All right, thank you, Lily. I'm now gonna be going into collecting year one outcomes. This is the first time you're gonna be writing to your year one outcomes. And this is located on the measuring uh, and reporting results. And I only want to focus uh, on this part about on year one outcomes. When you're looking at year one outcomes, you're really looking at the metrics you wrote in your 2122 LCAP. As a reminder, uh, you reported out mid year metrics with your LCAP supplement in February. So this is a culminating piece to what you did by entering the final data for this LCAP. So again, this is asking for you to enter your um, information within this block box here. You are not going to enter anything year two and three as that will be completed in subsequent years. So what are you measuring? These are uh, data pieces you are capturing here from year one for the year one outcome uh, data. They're actually measuring your eight state priorities listed here on this slide. And I wanna take a closer look on where you are gonna find this data this year. There is a resource that uh, we have um, for you and that's located in the resources uh, that you can use. And I wanna review some of the state priority areas that you might find some alternative data. As we know, there may be some of the traditional data sources that you may have available to you or some, um, data that you may not be able to look at as it is not available or it may not be current. So let's take a look at priority number one, basic services. Um, you can see outlined here that we have uh, priority one, A, B, and C. And all the traditional sources are all local data and our local indicators. Um, some alternative uh, data sources that we have listed here for you are for priority one, A, there's some CalPAD uh, reporting specific to 4.1 and 4.3. Um, I want to uh, put your attention on the as reporting date, as of, to be consistent as when you pull those, you wanna also keep in mind to write that when you pull that um, uh, data um, so that way you can show uh, consistency. For uh, student access, again, access to instructional materials, Something you might want to consider as alternative data sources is access to devices, internet connectivity, um, online portals. Um, the last piece with the FIT report, I know um, there's many of you that are doing um, possible um, construction or facility updates. So you might uh, want to consider what those updates uh, might be for facilities and good repairs. And again, all of these here are uh, typically what you do with some local and um, on your local indicators. Looking next at priority number two and priority number seven, again, these are all conditions of learning. Um, implementation of academic standards, um, that's going to be more local. Uh, we don't have any alternative data sources there. A, one of the alternative data sources you might want to consider is reviewing your designated integrated ELD implementation. Um, for priority number seven, a broad course of study. These are um, items that you possibly already do as you pull and look at local data, but looking at your uh, master schedules, looking at um, your designated ELD, your MTSS, possibly looking at your special ed programs and services you have for your special ed students and looking at MTSS support. Priority number four might be an area where uh, there may be lack of data in this, um, this area as you look at outcome data. So one of the things we wanna point your attention to is typically this is all done through the California dashboard. We know that the dashboard, um, some of you may have taken the CAS test last year, some of you may have not. However, for priority 4A, when it's asking for state assessments, 
something you uh, might want to uh, consider looking at with an alternative data is looking at your local measures and lo local assessments. Maybe you have some SBAC interims or maybe some performance assessments that will not necessarily replace the dashboard data. However, um, I wanna show you that later on how you might uh, write that in uh, one of the prompts there. Uh, continuing on with uh, priority number four, there are some alternative data uh, sets here that you can see. And again, these are all resources for you. Looking at the next one with priority four, again, more local um, data as it refers to your um, redesignated fluent English proficient count, um, possibly AP courses for your um, priority four G. And then looking at, in of course, um, grades for grade 11. Um, for priority number eight, um, typically that's done with other outcomes. Uh, again, those are open to you on what you um, listed for your outcome data there, but some alternatives to consider there. Here's priority number three. Um, and again, uh, these are all the same, but um, what we wanna point out here is consider, again, this is parent engagement, parent involvement. Consider all of the outreach that you've done so far from the beginning of the year to now, um, what possible phone calls you've made and some social media posts, consider what those may look like as alternative data sources. Priority number five, looking at pupil engagement. Again, we left here um, some alternatives to consider. A lot of these um, possibly are CalPADS report um, data, uh, but we also have in here um, some kids data. Those of you who have, um, your data already uploaded into our kids platform. There's tons of data reports and um, really uh, dashboards that you can look at on the kids platform that highlights attendance, chronic absenteeism. Um, and those are all available to you on the kids platform as well. Um, we did list here, there's some sources and data quests that um, might help you look at outcome data for high school dropout rates. Um, continuing on with school climate, uh, again, some more CalPADS reports, some uh, kids reports that you might want to take a closer look at. And uh, for priority um, 6C, other uh, local measures, again, those are um, local administrator climate si surveys, if you have any. So those are all um, outcome data that you're going to be pooling for year number one. And again, some of those data sets you may have access to, some of them may be you don't have access to. Um, we just want to provide some alternative ways to look at or where you might pull that data um, for this year. So when you are pulling that data, you start reflecting on your own outcome. And you may be dealing with some disappointing data or data that um, you uh, basically, it's not what you wanted it to be. And you might have some of these reactions on the far right, you might be defensive, you might feel dejected, you might disregard the data because it was a COVID year. All those are normal feelings and all understand this. And how you share your story about the data really tells your intentionality and how you and your district is committed to your educational partners and to your students. So being specific on what your story shares and why that data outcomes are the way they are, are really important as you look at your outcome data. So what happens if you don't have any outcome data or it's not available? Here's a sample that I want you to consider to look at. And specifically back to uh, what I called out earlier, it was gonna be on the, dash, the California dashboard, something that you may not have um, available to you because you didn't take the CASPI test, right? So um, here's the, the scenario example. Um, there was low participation rate last year on the, on the test that we uh, tried to administer, but we had a lot of students that were still in distance and some in, in person. Um, there's no academic indicator on the dashboard available to me, so therefore I might have to use more local assessments. Um, a solution here is provide explanation for the transparency with this and possibly an alternative to that metric if available. So when you get to this metric and you had in your um, outcome data, um, you had uh, English language arts for CASPI and you listed out that you were going to report out distance from standard. 
Here's a sample response that you could put in year one outcome uh, box that the CASP was not fully administered in the spring of 2021. So you're gonna state that to be transparent because we didn't do the uh, CASP, but then you're gonna go and provide some more local assessment metric below that may um, tell the story again on how students are doing in English language arts. All right, so here we get to our um, little guy with the uh, magnifying glass again. And again, this is to point out lessons that we have learned about year one outcome data. So what we've learned is after we're looking at all of this data for outcomes for year one, your data analysis lives throughout your LCAP. And what we wanna to continue to use is the lens of continuous improvement. Looking at your data details how you will know something you implemented caused an improvement or not. This analysis guides some key points that, you, that many of you will be asking uh, within your LCAP. So we wanna emphasize here that you don't need to duplicate your efforts and look at prompts or sections within the LCAP as isolated sections to complete. Sometimes we look at those prompts as let me just complete those uh, rather than there's a lot of prompts um, and a lot of sections that actually ask for data that once you complete the data analysis and looking at your data, you're gonna put that in many, many sections within your LCAP. Let me show you an example. We covered the plan summary in our first video series. And you can see here in one of the prompts from the plan summary is asking you for successes. Again, successes based on a review of the California dashboard and your local data. In fact, in the directions for reflections of successes, it specifically asks you to review performance on the state indicators and local performance indicators included in the dashboard, progress toward your LCAP goals, local self-assessment tools, stakeholder input, and any other information you're most proud of, and how will you maintain or build upon that success. This includes examples for specific groups like your English learners, foster youth, and low income. So one of the um, reminders here and, and things, lessons learned is really don't duplicate your efforts. You already did and, and looked at your outcome data. So whatever you found as successes in the outcome data is going to come back and, and live in another section within your LCAP that we covered again previously. So these successes again, can be based on your state and local data. And um, they don't need to reflect an, uh, an indicator of high status, but maybe reflect an area of high progress. This can also be a success overall for a particular student group. Data also lives in the identified need section located in the plan summary. Since you are collecting all the data outcomes, here's another example on how not to duplicate your efforts. The outcome data you'll find will have a place in multiple sections, as I said before. This prompt is calling for specific data you have identified in your outcome data. So if you take a look here um, in identified needs section, um, there are some must here. And again, these musts are referring back to the dashboard. And again, these are looking at overall performance in red or orange, even though we know that that data is, is an older set of data but any local data as well um, that um, the LEA looks at for not met are not met for two or more years. Um, this is also calling out any state uh, indicator which performance for any student group has two or more performance levels below the all student groups. So again, data lives in multiple areas. And again, the point here is not duplicate your efforts. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Lily and have her continue on with our session. Alrighty, thank you, Michael. So the next step in this process is to analyze effectiveness of actions in achieving the desired outcomes. So just a reminder, um, it is not necessary to evaluate the effectiveness of each individual action separately. Instead, you can group actions together um, in a way that you have aligned them to achieve um, improvement in a given set of metrics. For example, in this example, I have four actions, um, an after-school homework uh, support, 
online tutoring, some PD and supplemental materials. And together those actions are aimed at improving uh, students' performance on the LPAC, students' quarterly grades, and local uh, and their performance on a local ELA assessment. So I can group actions in this way as you're anal analyzing their effectiveness. Here's some questions that might guide uh, this process for you. Um, considering what group of actions um, have you designed to work together to impact the same metric? What data sources might be used to determine their effectiveness? Again, these will already have been outlined in your uh, current LCAP. Uh, who might you uh, recruit to help support the collection and analysis of some of this data? Uh, really looking at the differences between student group outcome data. And then finally, what additional qualitative or quantitative data might help support the analysis of effectiveness? And this might include um, engaging your educational partners through the use of empathy interviews, um, observation, or focus groups. So here's an example of what this might look like. And we provided this chart for you in the session resources in case you find it helpful. Um, so we have the LCAP goal listed here, improve academic and language proficiency for English learners. Then in the first column, I've grouped, this is my group of actions that have been designed to help improve performance on the LPAC, on the local ELA assessment iReady, and on uh, student grades. So I've included the baseline, which are already in my current LCAP. Finally, I've collected my year one outcomes based on the most recent data available. And I've listed here current outcomes on the LPAC, in iReady, and the rates of Ds and Fs. And then I've recorded the change, whether it's a decrease or an increase. Here I see a decrease in um, LPAC performance, an increase in iReady performance, and a decrease in uh, Ds and Fs, which in this case is a good thing. So based on uh, this analysis of um, student performance, I can evaluate the effectiveness of this group of actions and consider is there anything I need to change to one or more of these actions? Notice that the data itself doesn't give you a lot of information, right? So that's why that uh, analysis of implementation really goes a little deeper in helping us determine were these actions helpful for all students? Did all students benefit equally? Uh, did they benefit equally at all sites where we provided this after-school homework club? Again, gives us a little more information. For the purposes of this prompt, I can use this data to report out the effectiveness of these actions. Here's some reminders for responding to this prompt. Um, again, analysis of each individual action is not required. Not all actions are intended to improve performance on all metrics. Uh, you may assess the effectiveness of either a single action or group of actions. Um, and you must report on metrics in your current LCAP. And so here's a sample response for you, again, on explaining the effectiveness of specific actions. Um, and I'll just read it for you. LCAP goal four is to improve academic and language proficiency for English learners. LPAC results for 2021 show 39 and a quarter percent of students made progress towards English proficiency, which is a decline of 6.65%. English learners demonstrated an increase in the number of students achieving their typical growth goal in iReady by 7% in quarter three of 21-22. Notice that's my most recent data. English learner DF distribution in ELA for quarter three of 21-22 uh, showed a decline of 10%. So based on an analysis of these results, the district believes actions in goal four are showing to be effective in making progress towards the goal. The decline in LPAC scores is attributed to the remote administration of this assessment. Many students experienced technology challenges during the assessment, which may have had a negative impact on their performance. So notice I provided a short explanation as to why the district believes I had a decline um, if I'm going to consider these actions effective in helping us achieve uh, the goal. 
Alrighty, so the last step in this process is determining if changes to the goal are needed based on this analysis. And Michael will take you through this section. Thank you, Lily, again. We are now at the home stretch, and I'm going to review the last part of the goal analysis process, and that is determining if changes to the goal are needed based on your analysis. Remember, this is the last step of the PDSA cycle. Now that the level of implementation and effectiveness of actions in each goal has been analyzed, what small changes might be introduced to increase progress toward the district OCAP goals? Let's take a look at the last prompt in the goal analysis section. Prompt four actually asks you a description of any changes. So again, any changes uh, made to your planned goal, to your metrics, to your desired outcomes or actions that resulted from the reflections of prior practice. A sample response may be something like this. Based on an analysis of goal number four, again, I'm calling out the goal that we reviewed, the following changes will be made for the 22-23 LCAP year. And I'm simply going to make a list of changes that are going to be made either to the goal, to the metrics, and our desired outcome. Um, so I would make a list there. You notice that uh, these two uh, pieces really drive, one drives forward the other. So this prompt number four in the goal analysis section listed here drives forward the next part of our series. It drives forward any changes to the LCAP goals, if any, any changes to the LCAP metrics, if any, and any changes to the LCAP actions moving forward, if any. So um, prompt four is really important to tell the story about what are those changes and why. We encourage you to submit any questions that you may have that come up during this session to the digital parking lot. We'll be responding to questions as we receive them. So please check back periodically. That resource is located in the resource page for you. The next time we'll be analyzing progress towards L uh, uh, LCAP goals. That is our next session. Uh, this new section of the LCAP uh, replaced the annual update. There are new action tables that accompany this section, and this video release date is going to be here. Uh, we also want you to uh, register for our follow-up workshop. Our follow-up workshop is um, February 22nd. That's next week, uh, starting at 2 o'clock. And there is a Zoom link. Uh, we, we're hoping you to uh, for each of you to register for this. And uh, once again, our next video is gonna be released uh, here at the end of the month, uh, revising your LCAP to meet your local needs. And as always, we wanna thank you. Um, please email us if you have any questions. Uh, we're, we're here available to help you through all your LCAP needs or any other needs you may have. Our emails are listed there, our phone numbers are there. And uh, we hope you have a, a great, wherever you are at in time, night, uh, evening, morning, afternoon, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.